Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. And I think, Peter, we can then, you can share a start word. Introduction. Thank word. you, Roman. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining our British webinar about innovations in agronomy organized by the British Embassy in Kiev. My name is Peter Wickenden, and I'm the country director for the Department of International Trade in Ukraine at the Embassy. Our webinar today is about UK innovations uh, in agronomy, and it starts a series of webinars under the great British Agri Innovations campaign intended to showcase UK expertise in various areas of agri tech for Eastern Europe and the Central Asian network. We will do our best to make these webinars very practical and useful to you to highlight the most relevant areas where the UK can help with its innovations and years of expertise. So please follow our announcements on Latifundist, Kurko, and Tractorist websites, and our Facebook news. And don't miss the events organized by the Department of International Trade, which are coming up. The UK is a global center of excellence for agri-tech research and development, and is well positioned to support in addressing the challenges of sustainable agriculture development. We are very interested to keep continuity and certainty in the existing trade between the UK and Eastern European and Central Asian countries. And I hope we can build on our mutual trade relations and grow our business together in the future. So without more ado, please let me introduce our moderator today, Roman Rinishin. He's the founder of Travelite Mice and Travel Ukraine, and he's well known for his international agro consulting travel projects. Roman, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, like I said, welcome. And uh, I think that today we are sharing the weather, the British weather, because it's quite uh, dark, uh, cloudy today and we expect rain, which is a very uh, favorable thing for the farmers all over the world. So um, I would like to uh, introduce our speakers today. Uh, so except me and Peter Wickenden, we will be uh, hearing uh, two experts in agriculture uh, to cover our uh, five uh, four topics uh, which were uh, applied which were published on the website and everybody uh, all the audience will have a chance to ask them questions uh, via the web page of the website or if connected to zoom directly in the zoom chat so uh, uh, please welcome Simon Revel, uh, he is the sales manager for the company uh, who's, who's producing uh, OptiTeal establishment system. Uh, the company name is Clayton. Uh, Simon is by the degree egg engineer, but he's been practicing combining the professional egg engineering uh, equip, uh, experience with the sales for most of his life. Welcome, Simon. And also, please uh, welcome Peter Waldock, expert in herbs uh, and uh, the key uh, topic for his expertise is, of course, uh, commercial horticulture. Uh, he's involved in a big number of international projects and he is also a member of boards, several boards uh, within the United Kingdom. And today uh, we will be uh, hearing Peter mostly at the, uh, within the topic of the pests and uh, diseases uh, management that are currently causing troubles to the farmers in UK and in other countries as well. So uh, our plan for today uh, is going to be the following. The first part uh, out of the four will be the topic of uh, climate change problems. This is currently, uh, we are seeing the changes very uh, quickly, uh, happening very quickly over the last 
couple of years from my own experience in Ukraine, I can say that the uh, areas where corn has been grown, had been grown before, has shifted to the north due to the warmth of the climate. The rainfalls are changing, the time of the rainfall is cha changing very much and uh, farmers need to adapt to that. So this will be the first uh, chapter, the first part of our today's uh, presentation uh, webinar. <clears throat> then of course, uh, with the topic of climate change, we are facing the changes within the problems uh, with pests, diseases uh, in uh, uh, our fields. There are new uh, pests coming from the warmer areas to the northern uh, fields and farmers need to learn how to tackle them and how to prepare uh, in case uh, those are expected to come in a year or two. Uh, this will be the second quarter of the webinar. Uh, the third one would be the part about the chemicals that are being forbidden in, uh, in this uh, case we will speak about chlorpyrifos and uh, what are the options uh, to substitute it with uh, and how to change the technologies of production uh, when you have no possibility of using it anymore. And the last part, part number four, would be the most practical in terms of farming. This is the technology of uh, tillage, uh, the strip tillage. Uh, I remember the first time when I came to the United States with the group, uh, Ukrainian farmers were astonished seeing how come there is parts of the fields slightly tilled in a, in a row and the other ma majority of the field is uh, left plain. And the most interesting for them, it was that the tillage happened in the fall, but the actual planting happened in the spring. How could they, the farmers in the US, manage to fit into the same row with the same, uh, th that accurately. So, and now, of course, this technology has developed much more and um, our uh, presentees today will uh, tell us the practical sides of it and practical sec secrets of it. Uh, uh, why is it uh, something to be kept in mind and why is, why might it be useful for Ukrainian farmers as well and for the farmers in Eastern Europe uh, area. Okay, welcome everyone. Welcome dear audience. And I think we will start the, the first uh, topic, the topic uh, of climate change. And I'm inviting uh, Peter Waldock uh, to uh, say a few words about his vision of this problem. So, so in terms of climate change, and it's all part of the bigger picture that we see, also it relates back to approvals, changing production techniques, and also changing cost economics on crop production as well. So within the UK, within the veg sector, which is, our, which is the area I'm focused on most, we've seen a lot of interest in strip till systems, and Simon's going to talk about, Simon's going to talk about strip till systems uh, when he speaks. Um, this has been driven partly by wanting to reduce the amount of cultivation, which has a big cost impact by reducing the diesel input in the field. With GPS systems, we can actually grow a lot more in the field by using strip till systems. So we, we actually are now starting to see crops like say a brassica crop grown two years running in a field, but they'll grow in the reverse of the strip they grew in the first year. And it's also quite important in terms of moisture retention that by not turning the whole field over, suddenly we're not actually releasing a lot of moisture in the spring because we're seeing a definite trend towards warmer, drier springs, sometimes then followed by heavy, heavy rainfall, and sometimes um, just followed by a continual period of dryness, which is making establishment much harder, especially in areas where we haven't got access to irrigation. Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, so, and uh, Simon, uh, what, what is your vision of the climate change? How have you uh, experienced it in your practices and uh, 
uh, what do you what do you think? Okay. Yeah, right. Okay, maybe. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I think maybe if we could use some slides, I've got some data about uh, climate change and how that's affecting soil. So perhaps if we could just, uh, if I share my screen, if that's Yes, okay. please go ahead. Okay. Oh, sorry, wrong one. Bear with us. That should come through to you now. I hope you can all see that. Yes, yes. Now we can see the first uh, slide and the set of the slides on the, uh, okay, in the narrow window. Take the whole screen up. Okay, here yes. we go. Right, yeah. that's good. Okay, so just to give you a bit of an insight into us, we're predominantly farmers, but this all relates to what we're talking about, the subject at the moment. Uh, mm -hmm. The family Clayden are sixth generation farmers. We're now farming. 360 hectares and Jeff Claydon is very much an engineer as well as a farmer uh, so the business has been running now we actually celebrate 40 years next year and as you can see we farm in the southeast of England in East Anglia or on the eastern side which is uh, probably the most productive area for cereal crops uh, in the UK so whereas Peter's based down further south into Kent we're, we're just into the county of Suffolk. Okay, so one thing I've been involved with from a long time uh, is cultivations and tillage and crop establishment and being focused on cost reduction um, because we know that profitability is obviously linked to, um, to commodity price. So mm -hmm. we have to make sure that at all times farms are running as efficiently as possible and that encompasses a whole plethora of, of, um, of, of uh, things, issues that farmers have to look at from Peter's side on the agronomy, from our side on the soil and soil engagement. Okay, so that's a bit about Claydon. So I'm very much looking at soil. Mm -hmm. So just to give you some idea here, you can see the rainfall. Now, <laughs> like you, Roman, many yeah. people come to the UK and think, it's wet all the time. Well, yes, it is, because if you're in the northwest of the country and you can see on the right hand um, the rainfall chart, in those areas, yes, they get very much high rainfall. Where we are based, our average is about 600 millimeters. And, and that's, that's, that's annual, including the snow, annual. right? That, that's annual. That's, yes. that's annual. And that would be a 10. Okay, this is our average over the last. Um, four years or three years plus where we are year to date. Uh, we have a weather station here on the farm and at the moment we're running at 244 millimetres. So mm -hmm. if you think, as we discussed earlier, we've gone through the main growing season and we're quite a bit in deficit. Now the concern is that we may well then end up with a very wet back end when we start to establish most of our winter crops. So what is happening at the moment is we are seeing a change in the weather pattern, which is leading to issues. OK, so that gives you some idea. So we're down in the average, down in the brown, down in the bottom right hand side there, as you can see. But we are pretty short this year. I would add that many countries that I'm involved with and I've been on the export side now for 20 years, um, we are quite 600 five to 600 mil is quite an average there are places like bulgaria where it's down to 300 mil southeast ukraine where it's around that area there's other areas in places like northern italy uh, and northern spain where it's very much higher so big variances as you'll see you can see here the annual precipitation okay you can see that the darker colors are the higher rainfall and the as you go from yellow into orange into red is where the lower rainfalls are so you can see that the southeast of the country of the uk where peter and i are based which is predominantly arable and vegetables you can see that the rainfall there is uh, pretty much average to large areas like they are in east germany poland obviously your own country in ukraine and very many other countries in europe okay so that gives us some idea on the average rainfall 
Simon, and uh, from our experience, for example, you can see on this map uh, in Ukraine, uh, the southern part is uh, very red, which means dry. And this is the very area where this year, uh, probably you've heard on the news that we hardly had any snow at winter time, and the Odessa Oblast, the very southern part, suffered the most. They had to replant about 80% of their winter wheat, winter uh, crops uh, for that reason. Uh, uh, so it means that for Ukrainian case, the climate change means not only getting warmer, but changing the pattern of the rainfalls. For example, uh, if I read the uh, old books about uh, Ukrainian stories about Ukrainian uh, peasants living uh, in a very harsh winters with a lot of snow, now the situation is changing and we've had that old snow melted down and as a rainfall in end of May, uh, just flushing the, the houses and so on. So it, for Ukraine, the, the, the rain is not evenly spread out through the season now. And even this situation, uh, this pattern is changing even more radically. Yeah. Have you noticed something? If, yes. If I, on, if I can add in there as well. So that weather change is also impacting massively on the pest and disease. So this, this winter in the UK, we saw some areas where we didn't have a frost. So the overwintering of pests was a big issue, whereas historically they would have been killed off. Though equally, we're seeing that some of the predators are also now surviving a lot better through the winter. But it's changing how we have to approach a lot of the crops. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and the one thing that is important here is, and, and this isn't just a phenomenon for Ukraine, it's happening in very many countries. It's where, a world problem. Exactly. And the precipitation, where traditionally it was always rain through the prime growing season, we're now finding that we're getting it in various other parts of the season, which is creating an impact, particularly for crop establishment in the autumn, in some cases. And also, as Peter alluded to, very, very dry springs, where mm -hmm. spring crop establishment, particularly on the vegetable side, is, is, is a major problem. But we have to remember now that due to various other factors that there is a bigger swing towards spring cropping to help us cope with some of the uh, resistant weed issues that we're experiencing in certain areas particularly in the northern and cooler climates of, of northern Europe. Okay. And, and the other thing I'd put in is where, where Simon's talking about strip till and changing tillage that's so important because what we're seeing around the world is that when we get a rainfall incident, whereas we might have historically got 15, 20 millimetres, we suddenly get 60, 70, 80 millimetres, but it's so fast that unless yeah. the, the, the land can take it up, it actually rolls off. So you right. might lose three quarters of the, of the water that comes from the, the rainfall. Yeah. So you don't actually get the, the benefit of that within the long-term cropping. No, and, and, and the key point that we've um, experienced since the year of the soils, which is which was the science fraternity's um, initiation in 2015, we're learning an awful lot, and I'll talk a little bit about that later, about how important soil, good soil health, is to be able to cope with those prolonged dry periods, and as Peter has just explained, those really high intense rainfall instances that happen where you get a lot of runoff, which then obviously leads to erosion, which then we're eroding the topsoil which we can perhaps look at that now. So the one thing, and this isn't, look, we're farmers. In principle, Claydon are farmers, the same as Peter. We're intrinsically linked to the business. So it's in our interest to work with farmers. But we have to understand that soil is their, or your, our most important asset. And I put that, why do we abuse it so? We're farming. We understand that you have to farm in conditions that are less than ideal. But what we can do is try and learn and think about some of the things we're doing with basic things like tire pressures, weighting of the machinery. Don't cultivate the land when the conditions are not right and don't over cultivate. And that's the big thing that we've learned. Yes, and we have heard a lot of stories, for example, in Iowa, it seems to me at the beginning, the state of Iowa in the United States, in the beginning of the 20th century, like the uh, 1930s, uh, there was a big blow of the topsoils just due to the over plowing and uh, there were even 
roads hidden under that topsoil yeah. yes. uh, situation. So, and um, uh, the conclusion to be made, so if the climate is changing, uh, it's making the, uh, super, uh, the rainfall and even over the season, it making the average temperatures higher. So the main thing to adapt to these uh, conditions is to follow the healthy technologies of soil management. Yes. That absolutely. would be number one. Mm -hmm. And uh, what would you think uh, if we propose for the, our audience the top three things to follow in order to have a more or less soft adaptation to the climate change. What well, would be number two and number three? Okay, well, the first thing you have to be, do look, if we go back, can I just go back in the slides to show you this first slide? Hold on, mm -hmm. because this I think is important. So this is where we came from, the top picture on the left. So this was very much Jeff's, Jeff Claydon's original strip drill. Okay, so it's mm -hmm. very much based on a subsoiler. It was, um, he started to look at this because in 2000, you will all recall how very low the world wheat price was, and it was a case of survival. So Jeff, with his engineering brain, practical outlook, realized that the original step in the 70s into direct drilling using this technology was unsustainable. So he started to think, what's the one thing the plant wants? And it's good rooting. So we have to think what the plant, any plant, that whether you're growing peters, potatoes, herbs, maize, or any of the cereal crops, anything, you've got to get the root away. So the whole idea was he didn't want to do a separate strip till system like they do in the States. He wanted to do it because of our cropping all in one. So we only move the soil where we're actually seeding, but we banned the seed. So we don't have a traditional 125 millimeter row or 150 millimeter row. We would have a row that would be about 150 millimeters wide with spacing beside it. And I'll show you later on. So what we're trying to do here now, what we've learned, and this is the key point in the last 18 years, and it's important to look back at what we've learned. Our soil now is so healthy. We have not put any organic matter back in the soil apart from the crop residue. And predominantly we were a, we are a cereals rotation. So there's been no farmyard manure put back in. We've just done a load of soil testing on the farm and our organic levels are up to nearly seven. So if you think about it's that. percent of organic matter. Yeah, yeah. And, and a high, half of that is, 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 actually, um, is actually available. Um, half of that is organic carbon. So that's really impressive. We've got 4% organic carbon in the soil. So that's from doing this. Now, you asked the question, Roman, my yep. situation would be don't move the soil unnecessarily because of what happens. Now, if we go back down, I'm sorry to flick around. We can see here the degradation that's been taking place. This is a very old picture. I've been using this for 14, 15 years. And you can see predominantly where active agriculture is and intensive agriculture, we've got some very degraded soil. Now that's not just from agriculture, but the vast majority of it is. Now, if we start looking at some of these examples, you can see in the bottom left, we've got ponding. You guys would have experienced ponding in the Ukraine, you get snow melt, you've got compaction in the soil wheelings, and the snow, the water doesn't permeate down through the soil profile and you, you, you kill the crop. This is Denmark in the bottom left, UK top left, France the middle, New Zealand down in the bottom right, and then we have wind. Mm -hmm. And that's all brought about by intensive cultivation. And this is from experience. The European Union is doing a lot of work. The European Soil Bureau um, has done a lot of work on erosion risk. Um, and you can see the hot spots. Now, if you look at the right-hand picture in the green, you can see there that when I when I talk about this to farmers, they will say, what's half a ton of topsoil? And if you look at it in a heap in the middle of the room, it's not very big. But you start to extrapolate that out over a period of time. And if you think how deep most of our topsoils are, it won't affect me necessarily, but future generations could be affected. And most of that is brought about 
by the fact that we are intensively cultivating. Mm -hmm. I see. So uh, soil is number one to be uh, taken care of in the terms when the climate is changing and uh, the usual patterns of the weather, rainfall are also becoming very uh, uh, unusual. <clears throat> yeah. Now question uh, two, question yeah. two that you asked is looking at how your soil is physically and looking at it at the right time. Don't look at it in August, September when it's very dry and hard, okay? You need to be investigating this when there's humidity in the soil ideally and you've got crop rooting, fresh crop rooting going on because you need to see what's happening. You need to see if you've got any compacted layers, either shallow or deep, okay? Because if you're gonna go from a, if you're gonna transition from a conventional system to a strip till system, you must be aware of what's going on with the soil. Remember what I said, rooting mm -hmm. is the key. Because if we're having dry periods, we want capillary action to work, we want rooting to be able to get down. There's a picture on the right showing good structure. We don't want disconnections between the zones in the soil. And mm -hmm. I appreciate that it's difficult, but you have to be aware of that. There's a lot of work done above the soil, but there isn't quite so much attention taken. There is more now to be below the soil, and that is key. So we want to have good depth. We want root proliferation like this, unimpeded. That will then help, as Peter alluded to earlier, when you start getting heavy precipitations, the water can infiltrate down through the soil. And the better your soil health, the better you can cope with those extremes, whether it be hot and dry, and prolonged dry periods. And I think I think that's especially important. Yeah. I think when we when we talk about soils and, and some of the crops like maize, actually putting a cover crop or keeping the land filled through the winter is especially important in a lot of climates, because otherwise they are so prone to either wash away or soil blow if they suddenly dry out. And the picture there shows the root structure of, of whatever the crop can be, and that can be a cover crop, and that mm -hmm. will massively improve the, the overall conditions and the quality of that soil. Yes. Yeah, I was going to ask about the cover crops. What uh, role do you think uh, they can play? How much positive, uh, positively can it affect the uh, limitating of the soil erosions? Peter. Uh, I, yeah, think, the, I think the cover crops, the actual cover crops. The soil never left its spot. Yeah. A yeah, cover crop, some people they get very keen on doing very expensive, complex cover crop mixes. I think they can be great, but within the veg sector that I work within, you can often end up with land that might be empty for four, six, eight weeks. And even just to put a crop of, of rye grass or something similar that's cheap and easy to grow in there will add a big benefit. The one thing that uh, people are often not very good at doing is they'll plant cover crops of, say, a radish. And with the weather now becoming a lot warmer through the winter, they, they'll presume that it's going to be killed off and um, broken, out, broken down by the frost. That doesn't happen. And then you get a lot of crop trash you've got to deal with in the spring. Yeah, so that can create other problems. So yeah. I think you've got to manage the cover crop in the rotation. But cover crops are really important, yeah. whatever they may be. Yes, I, I would agree. Absolutely, Peter. Um, selection of the cover crop, making sure that you're not going to potentially use the same family that might create a disease issue or a disease carryover issue. Um, residue management, what I mean by that, is that you know you may have to burn that off at an earlier stage. We're finding that uh, destroying the cover crop if it's running through into a spring, we would try and get that done before Christmas. We are not experiencing frosts in our region. Further north in the UK they are, but in the south, in the east and the central part of the UK, we're not getting the frost that would traditionally take out those cover crops. The other thing we're learning as well is about that is the soil biota is kept alive. So you've got to remember, and I think we've got evidence with our own cropping and our own soils, that if you've got something growing in the, in the fields, then the biota, so that's the protozoa, the and uh, the fungi, the bacteria, the worms are all still working for you. And that's keeping everything alive. And there is a symbiotic exchange going on between the plants and the organisms that are in the soil, the bacteria and the protozoa. And that's key. So a cover crop can keep that going. It also keeps the soil alive. 
And it's not, there was a lot of talk about it was it taking nutrients out of the soil, but the interchange that's going on is actually in a lot of cases holding those nutrients in the soil. Simon, now that you've uh, put up this topic, uh, it's very interesting in terms of uh, putting the third, actually the, the, the next uh, uh, step in uh, adjustment to the climate changes. So we've talked about soil, that's the most important. And I'm sure that uh, the proper management of the soil could fit three uh, main keys of adaptation to the, uh, to the climate becoming more radical. But in order to help the soil, can we consider as the, let's say fourth key, additional like chemical or biological um, substances to be added to the soil to increase this symbiotic uh, correlations of the microorganisms in the soil or to improve the structure as a result of the improvement of uh, biological or uh, it's more the genetics of the new crops that needs to be paid attention to in order to adapt to the climate change. Yeah. We've got some very large businesses in Bulgaria that are working using biological additives to the soil. Mm -hmm. They have had a very positive effect using our system. So they would straw harrow once or twice, creating a mulch, mm -hmm. and then they use our drill to either establish a cover crop and where they're growing things like maize and sunflower, then they would precision plant that in the, in the spring with a precision planter. Or where they're establishing wheat, then they would go direct with the clade and seed drill. Now, they have got some fantastic results. If you look at uh, average um, wheat yields in that region, three, maybe four to four and a half tons per hectare, the guys that are practicing using the Claydon Optitil system, plus using the biology, that particular biology, which is two different um, sets of biological problem uh, products from two different companies, they have raised their yields by as much as 100%. Now, we are testing those here. Um, we don't understand it yet, but it would appear that because our soils are in such good health, we're not getting that big impact. I've mm -hmm. got other customers yes. in Kazakhstan, I've got other people in Lithuania, for example, that are having a positive. So I think the jury, the jury is out there a little bit on, and I'm not saying that's not, this is not a scientific evaluation. This is an observation. Practical one. Yes, mm -hmm. a practical one. Peter, would you like to add something? I would like to, uh, yeah. sorry, I'm sorry for interruption. I would like, Simon, for you to share uh, what kind of the program of this additives application uh, that is in the future. And because this is the thing that you were mentioning, that would be the very right thing for the areas like Odessa ones, the very I think, dry yes. ones for Ukraine. I, I think there's possibilities there, yeah. but we also have to think about all the other physical elements. The people that we're working with, the big farming companies in Bulgaria have started from a good point. So if you think they've understood what their soil, they've looked at the indices in the soil, they've then started to understand what is required, and then they've started from a good point. So I have to say this, if you're gonna wake up one morning as a farmer and think, right, I'm gonna apply biological products, and that's gonna be a panacea for success, yes. I would urge you to, be, to think again, because there is so many, um, different uh, points to be followed to do with the physical element and the I, I think the key element. thing is that actually all, all of the biological products will make will make a good crop better they won't make a poor crop good so okay. if your core cropping environment isn't right so if your soil isn't right nothing you apply whether it be to the foliage or to the soil is going to improve that situation unless you get your fundamentals right. Correct. To give you an idea, pythium in the soil can explode and, and overpopulate and kill a crop within hours. And then that population will collapse again afterwards. So we see that on carrots. So you're actually talking about a micro warfare zone in the soil. But if fundamentally that soil is, is sat wet, it's slumped, it's got no air, anything you put on isn't going to make a difference because the pathogens are going to be able to overpower the crop. Yeah. And, it's, and it's, it's a balance. I think also there's a, it's a balancing job. There's also, so we've got chlorpyrifos further through the discussion points. 
and actually where we've taken chlorpyrifos out of soil programs, even though it's given us more complexities dealing with other pest issues, actually it's massively improved the soil fauna because the chlorpyrifos is killing everything in the soil. So it might be killing the wire worm, but it's also actually killing the worms. Yeah. And the worms are a, a, a good friend of yours. It's actually, it's actually being very detrimental to the, the crop health. So when you drill a crop that hasn't got a seed treatment of chlorpyrifos compared to one that has, the one that hasn't got the seed treatment of chlorpyrifos will grow quicker and better than the one that has got the seed treatment. But if you have an attack, for, say for example, on field beans and you haven't got chlorpyrifos on the, the seed, bean seed fly can completely destroy that crop. So you have to be aware of taking, taking out a chemical and what that impacts on in terms of the overall pest or disease spectrum within the, the crop. Now I can see that we are slowly shifting to the second uh, quarter of our topic. Uh, thank you, Simon, for your very long uh, and uh, detailed uh, an analysis of the uh, climate change and the from the practical side. And Peter, uh, now I will share you the screen and share your presentation for you to have a word on these pests. So the new pests and the most Thanks. Uh, problematic pests that we are uh, that our farmers are facing these days and how you would recommend to tackle them okay so that's uh, okay so you didn't change slide you can see the picture well right mm -hmm. so uh, yes it, yeah. Peter, tell us what uh, Growing Earth Consultancy LTD uh, stands for, just uh, for us to understand. Okay, so if you, could, if you could drop on to the next slide, that'd be superb. Here we go. Perfect. So I, I set up, um, I've been producing veg crops around the world for the last 15, actually probably now 20 years. And my focus has always been in dealing with multiple retailers. So multiple retailers will be the Tesco's, the Sainsbury's, the Marks and Spencer's, the Aldi's, the Lidl's. And that's taken me around the world with crop production, but also gives me very much a good um, all round view of what's going on. So as well as looking at crop production, I get involved with ethical trade. So ETI is very, very important to the retailers now. So that would be how farms look after their staff and how they make sure that it's a, a safe and secure environment to work in. Um, and then I do a lot of work in terms of pesticides, but not just in terms of dealing with um, pesticide applications and approvals on crop production, but also making sure there are no residue issues or MRL issues that are coming through the supply chain into the retailers. And that um, can sometimes be one of the harder bits to deal with because we're often now dealing with historical residue issues from products that were applied 15, 20, 25 years ago. And with the, the quality of the labs being able to pick up on um, tiny, tiny amounts, we find issues that we have never, never had before. So on that, most labs are now working down to the equivalent of one grain of salt in an Olympic swimming pool. So that's 0 0.001 parts per million. So tiny, tiny amounts. Um, so my crop specialisms are brassicas, herbs, cucurbits, legumes, salads, and asparagus. But I do have a good understanding of a lot of crop production. So I don't do a lot of maize work, but I do a lot of sweet corn work and sweet corn and maize are both the same, the same crops in effect. Um, in terms of countries I work into, so UK, North and West Africa, um, Turkey, Hungary, Tunisia, Saudi Arabia, Dubai are all countries I work in and out of as, as replied, I did a tiny bit of work last year in Czechoslovakia. So I've got a, a general good understanding of crop production right around the world and issues that grow a seed. So if you flip to the next slide, please, uh, Roman. Yes, here we go. Mm -hmm. So in terms of pest and disease, and I haven't got details on the specific issues that you're seeing and having problems with in the Ukraine, um, but I've, I've listed here some of the, the key pest issues that we see. And I guess that um, as well as chlorpyrifos seed treatments or drenches on maize, you've also been using meserol as a seed treatment, which was withdrawn uh, last year. 
and Meserol will, will also deal with a number of these pest issues, but we were all using Meserol as a bird deterrent, which is a very different way to, um, to think of it. It was never approved as a bird de deterrent, but Meserol put the birds off. The birds either couldn't find the seed or didn't like the taste of the seed, so left the crops alone. And since Meserol has gone and we've lost Clopyrifos, we're suddenly seeing a lot more problems with bird damage on crops. It's probably actually now my, one, my number one pest in the UK. So running, running through relatively quickly, uh, pests that we're seeing are wireworms. Uh, wireworm without treatment and in, in continuous build-up is a massive issue and can destroy a, a, a maize crop. Um, leather jackets, especially when we're in rotations with grassland, we see a lot of problem, problems with leather jackets. There's some biological control, controls coming through for le leather jacket eye nematode. But actually, the principal control for leather jacket is actually reverse of what we've just been saying and soil cultivation. And the same with wireworm, soil cultivation reduces populations and leather jackets not following grass is one of the key things there. Frit fly, frit fly, tiny little fly, um, historically never an issue was being controlled by the seed treatments. We're now actually having to start to spray for frit fly. Um, the spray programs were neonicotoid based, whereas now we've lost the neonicotoids, we're having to look again at what we, what we do, but you've still got the neonicotoids in Eastern Europe. And I would have said the neonicotoids will start to become a key part of your sea treatment programs. We don't have that, uh, that option in the UK because we don't have um, neonicotoid approvals. The retailers have pushed hard to remove them from the supply chain. And that's even though they're not banned, they've actually now been withdrawn before they were banned. Peter, could I just say, Peter, could yep. I just say something about neonicotoids? Um, since the ban, um, which which happened, uh, I think it was three years ago, uh, we're seeing big changes in all seed rape crops. So, yeah. and uh, previously we would be growing about seven hundred and fifty thousand hectares of all seed rape. There is talks, uh, we had a meeting with one of the German seed breeders a couple of weeks ago, and they think we could be down to as low as 150,000 hectares for this forthcoming seeding season. So you can see, yeah. and the, the problem we have there is with the cabbage stem flea beetle. So be careful on that. Try and keep the rotation as broad as you can. Some growers now are stopping growing it because the risk of crop failure is too high commercially. Sorry, Peter. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I was actually going to mention a bit further on the, the neonix on cabbage stem flea beetle. So that's a perfect example. We always had flea beetles within the environment, yeah. but never and never really even sprayed for them because everything else in the environment was managing them. And the neonicotoids were just there enough to stop the pest taking over the crop in the early stages. And then it grew to a size that you might have put one spray on later in the crop production, but it wasn't a concern suddenly we've taken it out and it's a, it's a massive issue and you, you can hardly grow all seed right now in the UK yeah. or to grow it, you have to put so many foliar applications on. It's not cost effective to do it or you haven't got enough applications to be able to put them on because we've had to move to contact rather than systemic products. So yeah, so that's a perfect example of a change on an approval leads to a complete change in the pop, pest population. And then the other one that we're seeing more and more of is cutworms. And cutworms are a, a strange um, pest that you can have them in the background without a great, great issue. That's the bottom right picture, the grey uh, mm -hmm. caterpillar looking thing, but it's got a, a mouth part. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a strange pest that we didn't used to, to see a great issue with it. It was, it was controlled by the general pesticides we were using within the environment. And it was also controlled by rainfall. The best way to control cutworm as part of their um reproduction process they need to climb the plants if you can actually just wash them off uh with rainfall that did most of the control work and, and beating with rain used to kill them whereas now with with much less rainfall and not always being able to irrigate crops suddenly cutworms are becoming a problem we're also now seeing a second generation of cutworm in the uk that we never used to see so we're finding the larvae in the spring whereas they used to historically be an autumn pest so that's been a, a considerable change. And then the final one, the, the, the right-hand side top picture, silver wine moth. I'm sure you've already got that in right through um, the Ukraine because it, it comes to us from Eastern Europe every year. Um, 
And again, with the lack of seed treatments, we're seeing that becoming more of a pest problem and the population build up is massive. And on maize, that actually looks like calcium deficiency. And I've equally seen calcium deficiency confused with a silver wire attack both ways. They thought they had silver Y and they had calcium deficiency, or they had um, they thought they had calcium deficiency. And actually, when you open up the leaves, you got silver Y because they both cause the the foliage to to twist. Did you want to jump to the next slide, um, mm -hmm. Roman? Yeah, here it is. So pests that we're, we're worried about, and I, I deal with um, a lot of crops down in North Africa, and we're now more than worried there because they're actually moving in on one of these pests. So the European corn borer, borer has always been um, around. Um, it's an issue at the harvest point of, of crop production. And again, with systemic pesticides, we could actually deal with it as a, as a pest relatively easily with the loss of a lot of the systemic pesticides, now it's much, much harder to control because you, you in effect can't contact it. It will, go, it will lay and it will go into the, um, the corn and then be, be quietly eating away under the, um, the leaf, the uh, maize sheaf, so you can't get a direct contact on it to kill it. So that's a, that's a concern. I've also seen uh, pictures and crops through Europe that have in effect been eaten off at ground level by um, European corn borer and again when it comes in it is it is destructive and I deal with that as a pest in Egypt on crops like strawberries and in 24 hours the crop can just disappear be gone so it's not a specific um, pest of of corn it turns up on other things but maize maize is its preferred um, pest and then the other one that's that we're really um, really starting to worry about is western corn, corn um, rootworm so this is a big issue in North America and we're now seeing it on maize crops that we're growing in Senegal. I've now seen it in Egypt. So it's on the way up through Africa and it's moving hundreds and hundreds of miles every single year. Um, we had it turn up two years ago in the UK and the government signed off in 24 hours to drench the crop with chlorpyrifos, so Dersban, Dur to kill it because that was deemed to be the best way to, to destroy it out of the crop and to keep it out of the UK. Um, it's, a, it's a real worry to a lot of us because it is very, very hard to control. There are biological controls that are coming through the, the system for it, um, the, um, but they're, they're quite a long way from being able to use that biological pest release, uh, predative release to control that as a pest. And again, the population explosion can be massive when it explodes. And I've also listed two um, leaf diseases, which we're seeing moving up through Europe and into the UK. So eye spot is already in the UK, and I would imagine that's in the Ukraine. Um, controllable, but you need to run the fungicide program as a systemic protectant rather than as an eradicant or just a pure protectant. Uh, and then north, northern corn leaf blight, uh, we see it sometimes in the southeast. Again, you need to be controlling it with a protectant program rather than an eradicant program. And those uh, diseases are best to be, uh, the seeds should be treated. That's the best uh, No, bo both of those, it's a foliar spray application. Uh -huh. But you, you need to be actually understanding when you've got risk of the disease and applying the protectant chemistry before the disease turns up on the crop. So, so none of the chemistry is very good at eradicating it once you've got it. There's very little kickback effect against it. You need to actually use the chemistry using disease forecasting to put it on to protect the crop to stop the spores germinating. Uh, and just as an example for the uh, northern corn leaf blight. Uh, in terms of the season, uh, what is the program? How do you, um, uh, can you make it, uh, provide a detailed plan of how to... Uh, uh, the, so so we, we would be looking at that based on forecasting and risk factors and actually in the, in the UK we, we would spray for it occasionally if we're picking up that it's already in France so we know it's going to jump the channel. Um, you want to be getting warm, slightly humid periods of weather um, to allow for it to germinate on the leaf and come through. The control is actually relatively easy that most SDHI um, protectant fungicides will give you control without a problem. 
but we wouldn't spray every crop because of the cost impact of doing that but we would be spraying we'd probably spray about 30 percent of our crops based on on disease forecasting and risk and one maybe two applications will be enough to to keep it out I see. And um, uh, can we go back to the uh, uh, European corn borer? This is the problem that is quite popular everywhere. Uh, what yeah. would be the program to prevent or minimize? Because I know that uh, genetical modifications are not an option, which works perfectly yeah. well in there's Northern no, America. There's no, there's no um, resistance to, to that's that. That's right. That's right. Yeah, there's, so. very rarely, there's very rarely disease resistant so pest resistance but you can often find disease risk resistance will be bred into crops so both eye spot and northern corn bleed, leaf blight i know the breeders are, are breeding in resistance on those um so so that one was historically being done by either the measure or, or the copyrifos seed treatments there's mm -hmm. work going on at the moment looking at centropile which is very mark or benivia are the the trade names that you probably know can you spell um, them please for the audience to write down uh, Benivia, B-E-N-I-V-I-A, is is the way it would be described, or very mark, B-E-R-M-E-R-K, and there's actually approvals now in Hungary to apply very mark onto R seed rape seed against um, cabbage stem flea beetle, and I would expect that to work against corn borer as well. So that process is going is going through. Uh, we've also in the UK got trials applying products like cypermethrin onto seed, which again hasn't happened in the past because chlorpyrifos was being used. Mm -hmm. So I would expect cypermethrin to give you some protection in the early stages until you can get the crop to a point you could put a foliar application on. But again, a, a centropile, so Benivia as a foliar application um, is, is systemic, so that would give continued control. Is the C treatment part, which is the hard, the hard part to get it to get it through. I see. Okay, thank you. That's a good advice, by the way, and uh, an idea of what to expect uh, in the future. Should I go to the next slide, or? Yeah. So actually, that leads on quite nicely. If you flop to the next one, yeah. Mm -hmm. so. so just just a general sort of comment on approval. So everywhere I go in the world, the first thing I try and do is understand the approvals in that country. So how, how growers actually gain an approval, how the approval system works. So is it driven by the ministry signing off products? Is it driven by um, looking at other countries and just saying if it's approved in this country that has similar conditions, then it's approved in our country. So, and, and that's, a, that's a key driver. And then also you find you've got the drives from the marketplaces. So just because a product's approved. So in North Africa, for example, chlorpyrifos is still fully approved. Uh, it can be used there without any issue at all. It's still available in the country to buy, but we can't use it because it's not approved for use on the crops that we're exporting to Northern Europe. And we know that if we use it, we'll get an MRL issue, which will give us an exceedance. So we can't use it even though it's available. Mm -hmm. so, so the actual customers are driving the approvals that, that we can use as well as the government approval system. Um, so here's a quick summary that I lifted off a, a UK European database that we, we use to look at what's approved where. So in the Ukraine, I can see that four times a year, the ministry is updating the approval list, but I don't know how that approval list is driven. Is it by growers lobbying the ministry and saying, please, can we have this approved? which is actually how I work in countries like Saudi Arabia and Egypt. We go to the, the government or is it about the government being presented by the manufacturers? Please, can you approve this product? And that's very, very key on how that happens. And then the approval per process in terms of what data is required for that approval to happen. So within the UK and U Europe, it's taking us three to four years at the moment to get a pesticide approved for use on crops. And then it takes a further year for each addition onto that base approval of that product. So that's a massive, massively long time process, especially when you think that a, um, a, a pest or disease issue can come in and explode within two or three months. Yes, um, that, that's too long. That, that's definitely quite too long for... 
for the farmers, for the producers. I, I so, must say that in Ukraine, probably it works both. Uh, yeah. The companies are the ones who uh, start the conversation about having some products uh, certified in the country. And then they try to seek for their most powerful farmers to have a word for this uh, chemical. And then of course comes their negotiations. Yeah, and there's two other things on there that, that caught my eye. So one is the off-label minor use is a no. So that says to me that every single um, crop has to be lifted, listed on the label with the approvals. So that can sometimes be an issue, especially if you're a specialist crop grower growing, mm -hmm. say, herbs or niche cucurbit crops rather than just a straight maize grower. And the other one is seed treatments as a yes. So the seed treatment has to be registered for um, use in the Ukraine. Whereas what we see in the UK, so for example, up until um, the loss of chlorpyrifos as a seed treatment, all of the UK treated green bean, French bean seed was actually treated on a Hungarian approval. Because we find that Hungary actually has a more open system for, for seed treatment approvals. And as long as we could demonstrate it was approved in Hungary, we could actually sow seed in the UK with that treatment on it. Mm -hmm. nice. So that's an important part of the process. And seed is an international marketplace. Yeah, of course. Uh, there's, there are a lot of things to follow here and to keep in mind. Uh, and in Ukraine, I've heard a lot of cases, for example, when the um, uh, chemicals, for example, were used uh, in a rather wider uh, sets of situations and crops than it was uh, initially certified just because of the uh, all this bureaucracy and of course uh, to make it cheaper to enter the market yeah. they start with one crop or one uh, type of uh, application and then just uh, recommend that uh, to the farmers to, in the market that they can try to use it for others uh okay should i go to the next slide or that's pretty no, that's that's my slide so yeah mm -hmm. it's just if simon has any further comments to add in yeah uh, simon i actually have a question to you uh yeah. if you <clears throat> don't mind just a second uh, if we are talking about pests and diseases you are uh, uh you are the expert uh in tillage to the further extent, uh, how efficient is the tillage for those uh, pests and diseases? Is it, it an option to use to fight them? It, it can be, yes. For example, we use um, the straw harrow, which is an integral part of OptiTill, okay, which we use to help us control resistant weeds. So we know, okay, we're talking about weeds now. Um, there is resistance building in a number of areas on weeds and by us using a mechanical system that uh, actually uh, if I can I show can we go back to the slides Roman it might be uh, practical of course you can use uh, you have the permission you can share your screen Because I just, I think this, as a practical side, will will just help us what I need to do. Well, while you are opening, I have a question from the audience to Peter. Yeah. Have you faced uh, the pests named uh, Julida? That's J-U-L-I-D-A. It's a small black worm. Uh, according to the... I don't know that under that name, but that doesn't mean I don't know it because everybody calls the same pest different things. Mm -hmm. uh, у нас запитання, чи uh, зустрічався наш uh, спікер з проблемою кивсяка, кивсяк, такий шкідник. На жаль, говорить, що не, не, не відомо йому. Uh... So that's a millipede. Uh, no, I've not dealt uh, with millipedes as a, a pest in the UK or overseas. Um, let me just think about where it sits within the sequence. I would imagine that the, the controls for wireworm would deal with millipede as well. 
So mm -hmm. it's going to be it's going to be in the same sequence. And if if you're using a nematicide within the crop, um, nematicides would would normally impact on the wireworm, especially um, uh, monsterin, and mm -hmm. that would also kill millipedes as well. Okay, thank you, Peter, for the ideas to follow. Um, okay, uh, Simon, you can now uh, proceed with that. Slide. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna run the slideshow like this because I'll be flitting backwards and forwards a little. Yeah. Um, we unfortunately, through and I would urge, and I'm sure Peter will back me on this, um, mm -hmm. through uh, farmers and some agronomists by reducing the active ingredient um to try and save costs have inadvertently bred resistance into certain weeds um now the prolific one that we have is the one on the left your left black grass we call it black grass um and that is actually spreading now it started off in my region where i live uh many years ago and has become a particular problem to cereal growers um, in particular, uh, but it is changing, and we've noticed now it used to be a autumn um, germinating uh, weed, and now we're finding that it's actually metamorphosizing into a spring uh, uh, germinating uh, weed as well, and it is resistant resistant to almost every chemical. We've got trials here. We've been conducting trials here for the last ten years on the farm. There are some new chemistries coming through. But more importantly, you can see that you've got a Pyrrha spice venti. Now that has a similar effect on the crop that if you don't control it and you don't keep on top of it, that it will swamp the crop and dramatically really hit yield production. And that has that tends to have the same effect as black grass, but prefers lighter, um, lighter soil. And the other big one that is really prevalent now, particularly with the use of it in anaerobic digestive plants, uh, is ryegrass. And so those three grass weeds are a particular problem for cereal growers. Now, I would add that, that there are some broadleaf weeds that are becoming problematic as well. And I would urge any of the farmers that are listening, that if they use a chemical product and it doesn't get killed or all the plants don't get killed, then you have to ask why you must get those plants that haven't been killed tested to see if there is a chemical resistance because I can only see that becoming a bigger problem. We can control and, it. Sorry, go on, Romain. And I was going to say, if I add into that, that I'm, I deal with more, more and more weed complexities, weed resistance, and also holes in herbicide programs. So we haven't mentioned it so far, but there's been a lot of changes over the last three to four years on the approvals and what's available to use on the herbicide side. So a good example is that we used to use in veg an awful lot of linuol, which was a really good chemical. It controlled a whole range of weed issues. With can, can, can you spell it please? Uh, I'm sorry, Peter, can you spell it please? From the L practical ideas uh, yeah. for the audience. Mm -hmm. L-I-N-U-R-O-N. L-I-N-U-R-O-N. Uh -huh. And it was a very, very good herbicide on crops like uh, carrots, asparagus, beans. We used it on a number of crops, very, very crop safe. We understood it. As soon as that was, was lost, and it was lost very, very quickly over a six month period, we've got alternatives that we're using, but the alternatives don't fill the holes, i.e. there's changes in the weed spectrum. And we're suddenly seeing weed issues that we've never, we've never had to deal with in crops before. And again, with our chain, so I grow a lot of ryegrass as a, as a, as a cover crop, as a, as a gap filler in effect. But ryegrass, as Simon says, also can actually be a, a problem in terms of as a, as a weed within cropping. We're seeing now a lot of bindweed and fat hen that is very herbicide resistant. We've had fat hen this year that we've put five litres a hectare of glyphosate onto that it hasn't died. And that's quite concerning. And that's driven by the environmental that the, the weed is a lot tougher this year because it was a lot hot and drier. Yeah. And also, um, we do think it's starting to become resistant to glyphosate. Hmm. It's an interesting. Yeah. yeah, and that's, by the way, the very problem uh, with this glyphosate resistance uh, facing North America. I yeah, remember, absolutely. 
the first time when I came uh, to the United States in 08 with the group uh, it was uh, coping with probably all of their problems uh, the glyphosates but uh, for example last year in the fall uh, they are shifting to more of the classical control pet, uh, programs using the chemicals that ha they had been using long before, maybe a yeah. little bit updated uh, versions. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, so if I can, you, you asked the question, Roman. So yeah. the reason I wanted to show you this is within our system, this is what we do to help. So uh, we, chase the, we chase the combine harvester with the straw harrow. So mm -hmm. we use the straw harrow very effectively. Now this is only the real, the only real cultivation that we do. And we're only moving the soil 30 to 40 millimeters, no more. And mm -hmm. you can see the top, the biggest picture on the top left, that's already had one pass. So what does the straw harrow do? Well, the first thing it does is it distributes the straw as evenly as possible, particularly in a very high crop. If you think our farm averages here on wheat, we're looking about 10.5 tonnes per hectare. Okay, the national average here in the UK is just over eight. So we get some pretty heavy crops of straw. So we want to distribute that and get a little bit of a mix of soil in there to try and generate any uh, weeds, volunteers from the old crop to germinate. We, what it also does is it mulches the soil. So we get this nice mulch across the top of the soil. So that helps preserve any moisture that's there. And it's very important to chase the combine. So normally there's some good tilth, a certain amount of moisture there from the combine. Don't let it dry out, hit it with the straw harrow. We can get some really high outputs with this 15 meter up to 28 hectares an hour. So we mm -hmm. can you know, keep up with the combines. We then decide on the actual germination and we may actually straw harrow four times but it is only the same cost straw harrowing four times as one at full rate application of glyphosate with a 24 meter self-propelled sprayer okay mm -hmm. so you can see and the diesel usage is minimal i mean if i if because the one thing that we're looking at commercially is how can we can save costs we have a 15 meter straw harrow with a 300 horsepower tractor, that's our main mover on the farm. You can have less horsepower. We're only using, as you can see here, 1.7 liters mm -hmm. per hectare. So it's very, very cheap and efficient. So that's a mechanical way. We still use the chemistry, but we use mm -hmm. a, mechanic, a mechanical situation to A, preserve the soil, because we're not in, interacting deep within the soil, we're not destroying the earthways, the earthworm burrows, we're not destroying the biota because we're not exposing the soil to the UVs from the sun, which will kill the bacteria, the fungi, the protozoa. And warm and it up. That's it, exactly. And we get this nice mulch. Then we would leave it until we're ready to seed, and then we would come in with the seed drill. So the whole okay. idea, if you look, if you look at this next slide, this is the sort of situation that we get. So you can see that we have the seed growing in a band. We've not, we have done some work here. So the leading time from the strip drilling process is cultivating here, allowing the roots to get away, which is absolutely key. We have to get the roots away as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. because, because we're growing in a band, okay, we've got, we get good tillering, we get a lot of air and light into the crop which really helps. And you can see that the old roots are left undisturbed. That becomes plant food uh, or gets broken down by yeah, the fungi and the bacteria. So we're really starting to preserve the soil and keep the soil biota. And I think that's one reason. Now, from our experience, we've got many people now that are coming up to five, 10 years into the system and they are experiencing the same with their soils. They're becoming easier to manage they're using less power, okay, and the soil biota is improving, and particularly earthworm numbers. Okay, so, so if I just comment from a brassica point of view, while Simon's got that slide there, um, so that's exactly the same sort of format that we're looking at working with crops like brassicas. 
that we're we're in we're in effect strip tilling, but we would tend to be rotivating or uh, doing more cultivation than you would with a cereal crop. And then we would look to the alternate year to put the brassica into the space between where you grew the crop this year. And we're looking at establishing um, cover crops under the, the brassicas. And sometimes that can just be something like a, um, a clover crop. So that's got a, a nitrification benefit to it. Uh, and that will get cultivated out, but will grow back into under the crop again. So there's, there's a lot of interest and drift towards, I know some quite big growers that are now using this type of system very successfully and improving soil health and um, crop establishment and minimising moisture loss when they're establishing the crop. And that moisture um, being retained is also very, very critical. Yeah. Thank you, uh, gentlemen. So in order to uh, keep up with our plan and uh, I mean schedule, and we already are having a bunch of questions uh, from the audience, I would like to, uh, we've covered partially the topic of chlorpyrifos banning. Peter, if there is something Ed, that you haven't mentioned, but you were going to in terms of this topic, within this topic, um. uh, Please there, go there's ahead. one there's one bit I would say on chlorpyrifos. It's a much bigger picture than just chlorpyrifos. And you need to, rather than looking at one thing in isolation, you need to look at the whole crop. So varying by the issue seen, it's, it's not just about chemistry that you use, changing other chemicals. It's about resistant varieties. It's about rotations. It's about pest and disease <laughs> forecast and, forecasting and trapping preventative spray programs, rotations, and management of crop residues. And all of those things impact on, on what you do next. So the loss of chlorpyrifos means that the agronomist actually needs to get a lot better at understanding the whole picture around the farm. Whereas chlorpyrifos actually made people quite lazy, that you just um, went out there, you sprayed it, and that was that. You know, it just killed everything. Whereas suddenly you've got to, as an agronomist, really look at the crop and understand what's going on in the crop and what's going on in the environment around the crop to deal with it in the best way. I see. Thank you very much for the ideas. Of course, like they say, that farming is like gambling. In this case, uh, the rules are just making a little bit, uh, have, have been made a little bit uh, harder for the, far, for the agronomists, but their qualification and their experience uh, should find a way out. And in this case, just the correct identification of the problem is half a way to its solution. Yeah, I, I would agree with that, Roman. I think attention to detail is key. And I appreciate when you have large areas of land to look at both from the agronomic side and from the soil mechanics, it, it's very important to try and spend more time. And I think there's, without being too critical, I don't think there's enough time spent on the finer details and you know trying to look deeper into some of the situations. Which would yeah, and the interactions of everything. So you can change one thing very slightly and it can change everything completely. And often yeah. people don't understand how everything is interacting with everything else. Like a butterfly uh, sp sprays with the wings on the one side of the earth and on the other side, you get a hurricane. It's like from the movie, uh, Hollywood movie. Uh, so in order to uh, proceed with our uh, plan, uh, the next step is the strip tillage. And we have a bunch of questions already prepared for this topic. Uh, Simon, you would be most welcome to cover them while doing your part of the strip tillage presentation. Okay. I will just translate them for you. Please tell, uh, so there is a participant who, have, uh, who has your drill uh, and uh, they are wondering what to start with when they are planting wheat. Uh, wheat. Uh, they didn't specify whether this is winter wheat or spring wheat, but I presume that this winter is winter wheat. wheat. Yeah. Uh, also, what uh, that's the second question from this uh, participant. What fertilizers uh, you recommend to apply at planting for winter wheat, as we have come uh, uh, have understood? And what are the amounts I know that amounts of fertilizers, uh, they are to be calculated depending on what's in the soil. But if we are talking about the average soil 
with uh, little deviations from what's normal. So what would be your recommendation? Uh, also, uh, when you are going to be speaking about the strip tillage, the, there is a question, how popular strip tillage is in Europe and partially, in, especially in United Kingdom? And uh, uh, what is the share of the lands strip tilled in a uh, versus the the other types of soil tillage or no tillage or plowing whatever it is uh, and um, how does it depend upon the conditions the region the climatic conditions and maybe uh, some other conditions so the uh, spread of the strip tillage how fast it is in one areas and how wh why is it slower in the other areas so how the conditions influence and uh, of course now i give you the word you can share your screen with the main part of your presentation right. about what i'm going to do what i'm going to yep. do is i'm just going to grab another presentation mm -hmm. i think this would be uh, quite important if you just bear with me a second uh, Going to go to this one because right. What I'll try and do is I'll try and answer some of those questions. So I'm going to go down to. I'm going to talk about if I can, Roman, the strip yeah, yeah. tillage, how it works. So you've got an yes. idea. Now, one thing I would really want to cover is this one here. Let me just go back now if I come back to the Zoom, uh, come back to here, share screen, just bear with us. This one here, and I'm going to keep this open. This yeah. is, for me, this is key. Um, I spend mm -hmm. a lot of time looking at soil, and I've looked at soils very similar to Peter all over the world, from North Africa down to Australasia, China, uh, Russia, and pretty much everywhere else, including North America. Now, the key point for me, whether you're growing a, a, a vegetable crop or, or, or any crop, we've got to understand what's going on in the soil and what effects there are, that what has been happening in the soil. And we have to think about history. So if we've been continually doing one process as a primary cultivation, we may end up with a situation like this. this sorry, start again. Uh, this one here. So we could have a double compaction. This is actually in Ukraine. Okay, this was a picture that I took 12 years ago. Um, and what we have to be careful of is that we're not trying to set up a strip till program into soils that are badly compacted like this, because you will not gain the maximum effect from it. And you won't gain the maximum effect from any other tillage system or establishment system that you're using. We have to remember that soil, okay is made up of 50 percent aggregate or solids so that's the soil particles you want about 23 percent of water in there and you want air about 23 percent and then hopefully your organic matter is up around the fours most soils unfortunately are below two uh, particularly in 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 further east so you know that that's the makeup we have to think about that as where we want the soil to be all right so that's very important so starting from a good point is very very important and you can see here my question and i and i run this all over and my survey is and i've been doing this now for the last 12 years is how many of you own a spade many many farmers own a spade but actually how many look at the soil below the surface and i can tell you it's 10 percent, 10 to 15 percent and unfortunately, that's as important as it is using Peter's experience and the agronomy advice above ground. So anyway, that's, that's well, my little, Speaking my about the spades, speaking yeah. about the spades, I remember last year we had a group to uh, uh, Midwest and uh, out of 10 participants, there was one agronomist, chief agronomist, agronomist of the Ukrainian farm and when we came into the field the first thing he uh, everybody is taking a, a cell phone to take the pictures of the crumples of this uh, of the uh, plants in the field and the first thing he did he put out his uh, small shovel spade and started uh, digging the soil to understand what's underneath great great very important now 
you ask about starting, one of the questions was about where do we start with strip tillage? It could be a clade and it could be another strip till machine. When you're harvesting cereals, it's very important to get your stubble height not, not too long. Um, it doesn't have to be very short, but you need to get a good chop and spread. Because if you can get a good chop and spread, we're now talking 12 meter plus headers. So the modern combines now are pretty good at getting a fairly good chop and spread. The other key issue is the grain husk or uh, the seed pods, if it's all seed grade, you want to try and get those spread as far as possible. Okay, so that's very, very important. And then we would chase the combine. So I'm just gonna run through, uh, I may have to go on to this because there is a video in here. I hope it works. Here we go. So this is all we are doing with the straw harrow. We're not moving the soil deep at all. Very fast, very quick. You can also see here, it's very good at taking out the volunteers and the rubbish. So we're not using chemistry, we're using the mechanical system. And because we're only moving the soil about that much, 30 to 40 millimeters, we're not getting serious evaporation. And we get this nice mulch below. So the output is really good, very cheap to run. You can see this is 200. 220 horsepower class so it's still pulling it this is one of our experiments on comparing that to a chemical uh, which we have here on our own farm so destroying the cover crop with chemical okay and right so what we're looking at is to manage the crop residue eliminate the volunteers because we can take the volunteers out now the um, the amount of time that you have to depends on the growth. You don't want the plants getting too big. So you want probably above cotyledon stage. We would generally hear in our climate, it would be something like seven to maybe no more than 10 days. And we're taking out the volunteers, the weeds, and in particular, if we've got resistant grass weeds. Now, unfortunately, black grass doesn't start germinating until later on. So we then drill late into October, where you would be drilling a lot earlier in the bulk of Ukraine. Slugs depends on where you are and where you're farming. They're the little chaps that come up and nibble away at the new growth or um, burrow out the seed if your seed in depth's not consistent. But the key point for this for Ukraine, generally, all those Southern European areas, is we create this mulch. And this is where we're getting fantastic benefits from those guys, particularly in Bulgaria, where we have a lot of products running, and southern Germany, Hungary, uh, Spain, and areas in France, okay? So that's the first thing that we would look at would be with the straw harrow. Um, sorry, I'll come out of that because I don't want to talk about that product, so it's not fair. Then what we would then do is we would look to come in and seed. Now, the drill can cope with high levels of trash. Um, this picture on the left is uh, in Latvia. So um, you've got high levels of trash there, seed in all seed rape. We've got mounted drills. You can see this is on our own farm top right. That's been straw harrowed, I think twice. And then we've got spring drilling direct down in the bottom, uh, drilling spring oats. Uh, that was done in April. Uh, in 2018 when we had a very wet spring um, alternatively so it was very very late on but we are moving the soil minimally and the, the drill has been designed or the strip drill has been designed to move the soil the least amount but where we are planting the seed so the leading time you can see here working into the soil and then we have the a share which actually clears the trash and places the seed in a band. So that's what we're looking to do. So we're not moving all the soil, we don't need to. We've been very precise with where we put the seed and we're able to cope with high trash. So whether it be establishing a cover crop or catch crop after harvest or seeding or seed rape direct following a cereal crop, the drill will cope. We can drill various um, 
crops with it and we're experimenting all the time we've even even established maize and we're getting good effects with that as well we can apply we can apply uh, fertilizer you can see here we can apply it down with the leading time on this picture here so the leading time works down can work down to 20 centimeters if required and then we band the seed here but we could also put fertilizer here as well so we have two choices now advising somebody on fertilizer from sitting in the uk to talk to the customer in ukraine is very difficult the first thing i would recommend is that if we would do a soil nitrogen test to understand what's in the soil um, and then for example here in the uk peter i might need help here i think we're only allowed to put 30 kilos of n down um, per hectare in the autumn Yes, by the way, I was going to ask you a question uh, to uh, ask you to mention what are the total amounts of NPK and maybe some trace elements that are needed for the maximum uh, yield of wheat, winter wheat uh, applied in the United Kingdom, just to compare to the practices in Ukraine, including, including the, what's in the soil. So not uh, the remaining part, but total what is needed for, let's say, nine tons of metrical tons of uh, winter wheat uh, yield if you have those figures uh, Peter you will need uh, Peter you need to unmute your uh, microphone yes yes mm -hmm. that's it yeah so yeah so I don't do serial work so I can't I can't answer that one specifically but what we have to do is we have to work to a set of tables uh, that are published by a government body which means that we aren't exceeding the levels so we don't run the risk of environmental pollution with nitrogen. So Simon says we're limited to about 30 kilos of actual product of actual active nitrogen in the autumn on a crop and then we can top it up again in the spring. Yeah. Um, what we're actually tending to do now is we're, a lot of us are drifting towards more and more foliar feeding because the foliar fed nitrogen A doesn't get involved with the environmental um, regulation requirements but also when we start having periods of, of dry weather, we've seen a lot of benefit with using foliar nitrogen on crops like maize and, and cereals because it goes direct into the leaf. So it's not required to be taken up by, by the roots. And before we started doing that, we were seeing problems that we'd put on a spring application of, of granular nitrogen and it would just sit there um, not, being, not being washed into the soil because we didn't get any rainfall irrigation to wash it into the soil. And what so, are the, the rates that you can apply for early within one pass? Uh, it, dep it depends on the, t on the level in the soil that you've got. It's not a straightforward question. You have to base that no. on the field. No. Straightforward okay. answer. It's got to be based on the sealed and what the recommendations are. Yeah. Yes, yeah. but, but what is the, the, the maximum limit in order not to burn the leaves of uh, the, the maize? Oh uh you're actually driven by the maximum amount you're allowed to apply not the not the limit yeah i've never i've never applied enough to burn a crop so i don't know what the upper limit would be ah, i see because i've heard the cases when they're um in hydrous ammonia no not in hydrous uh the dry uh urea not nitrogen. yeah so yeah, yeah. Dry so, so, so something, was... something like urea is a lot more scorchy than say a calcium nitrate so it depends on your nitrogen so yeah. if you're using uh, if you're using a, re a urea based product, I wouldn't want to go more than 110, 120 kilos of product in one single pass. Mm -hmm. So that would be about 40, 50 kilos of, of N, depends Excellent. on what you're using. Mm -hmm. if, okay, if we took our, yeah, if we took our farm standard here, we may put DAP down um, a small amount in the autumn uh, just to give the plant a kick. Uh, and then the principal applications would be would start and that again depends on the weather as Peter says but if we generalized we would then be putting three applications spread from weather dependent February uh, and then split over um, into April and May uh, probably somewhere around about 70 um to maybe 80 kilos per hectare in those doses but i, I would stress uh Roman, that what many people are doing now because nitrogen we have to understand nitrogen is quite toxic 
and we're mm -hmm. finding we've got some experiments going here where we have cut our nitrogen rates considerably now the reason we're doing that is because we think our soil health or well, we know our soil health is so good that we think there's so much interaction going on with the biota in the soil that we're actually using a lot of the free nitrogen and because of the crops that we're growing and we're now experimenting with cover crops as well um that we think we can start i mean it's early days yet but we're into our second year of reducing our nitrogen inputs dramatically on two different crops the first we, we cannot take it from year one we have to roll that out to at least five years and but it, it looks interesting so i would urge anybody we are now taking leaf samples we're taking soil samples and we're also uh, taking grain samples when the product is uh, sent to the millers or the mills okay so we understand exactly what the nitrogen usage is over the whole period of growth as to what we've got in the soil now, and then what i'd add is that foliar nitrogen has become cheaper over the last three yes. or four years and granular nitrogen has become a lot more expensive and you you lose i mean around 30 percent of the granular nitrogen you put on actually just gets washed away and ends up in the in the water courses and especially with these extremes and weather conditions where you'll suddenly have a vast amount of rainfall that's actually not good for the environment the water authorities don't like it and this is what drives us our our management of nitrogen within the um yeah. within the crop production and it's a waste of money to wash it exactly. away yeah. it, exactly and i think you know precision placed nitrogen uh understanding what the plant requires to produce the optimum yield for any given hectare now that optimum yield might be different in in ukraine and it would be different from the south to the uh, west of ukraine um, as it would do as it would be here you know and and so it depends on the crop that you're trying to grow what your averages are in yield and how much that crop is actually going to take up particularly when and, it comes to cereal. And an over application of nitrogen can encourage very soft lax growth, which is actually perfect for pest and disease. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. So, so if, if nitrogen is going on to a level it's scorching the crop, that's too much nitrogen. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, according to the University, it seems to me of uh, Ohio, uh, the, ad, under the very favorable, favorable conditions, uh, if nitrogen is applied in the fall, it will lose, we will lose at least 10% in the conditions close to ideal by the time it is needed to the plant. So of course, at least, but it can be lost even at full, a full amount. Uh, Simon, what are the, or maybe have you practiced application of the trace elements in addition to the NPK with the strip tillage in the fall? Gen generally that tends to be yes you can do because obviously you can have if maybe for all seed rate where um uh, sulfur would be very important because there isn't the sulfurs now being deposited in the soil so again you would want to know what your sulfur content would be to then gauge what amount but most people are applying sulfur now when they're establishing all seed rate um we tend to go for very low amounts of nitrogen because of the restrictions, but there might be uh, phosphate would be something that would be important, particularly in and around the seed. So the plant then has, uh, a, a, you know, it has the phosphate close to it. That depends, of course, on your soil pH. So you have to be, you know, if you've got one extreme, I mean, we've got high alkaline soils here, so we do apply phosphate although we have a lot of phosphate in the soil it's locked up and it's not available to us okay so yes we would then also uh, zinc i think for all seed rape is another important trace element so that would be something that we would look at as well to see what the availability of that and what's in the soil so it's very much as peter says you know chemistry chemicals fertilizers are very expensive we just don't want to apply them um, in a random way we want to understand what the plant needs and it's important it's not what we think the plant needs it's actually what the plant requires and the plant will only use what it requires to maximize its yield output mm -hmm. so uh, to compare the strip tillage for corn and for wheat uh, with corn strip tillage has two applications in the fall 
after the previous crop was harvested and then it is planted in the, in the right ditch in the spring. With winter wheat, it goes all together at one pass. So at first there is a, a knife that knives in uh, the part, yeah. part of the fertilizers and then comes the disc and they do the actual seeding. Uh, are there any technologies to, to split these two? I mean, have you test tested or considered uh, splitting these two applications, uh, pass, passes in the field, maybe it would make some sense or uh, the, the most effectively it works only with all together at one pass? No, no, What to be fair on that, the whole idea of doing it in the one pass is to keep the cost down, mm -hmm. preserve the moisture, any humidity that's in the soil to preserve it. Um, and if we've got a spring crop, which now there are more spring crops being grown, okay, because to try and expand the rotation. Uh, Northern Europe was very bad at having a very tight rotation. So we would have probably two cereals, maybe even two wheat crops and, a, and, a, and an all-seed rape, which has caused some of the problems that we discussed earlier. So now people are actually expanding their rotation. So we've found it very effective where we actually seed a cover crop Okay, so we would check again the combine, store harrow maybe once and come in with a cover crop and establish a cover crop of depending on what the advice would be within the crop rotation. So we would do that pass and then take that cover crop out probably pre-Christmas, maybe post-Christmas early. So that's got the chance for the cover crop to, to, to break down and die off so that we can then start getting a little bit of uh, air into the top soil and then we would seed the crop, spring crop, whatever that might be, um, as soon as we can get onto the land. Normally we would hope sometime during February, but certainly in March. Okay, so, but we would use the same drill. We wouldn't use a system where, a separate system where we would cultivate because we understand now the benefits of a cover crop is given remember what we talked about the soil biota and keeping the whole soil alive during that winter period mm -hmm. okay that's um, I, I see that and if we come back to our questions uh, let's let's double check what yeah, we sure. have let's here try and answer those. Uh, mm -hmm. so uh, uh, could you remind me Roman sorry I yes. think we've answered some of them I didn't write them all down I have to say uh, that's, that's the reason why I'm, I'm uh, referring to them right now. Uh, uh, so, the, the, the participant wanted to know what steps by step by step in terms of planting winter wheat and using Claydon, uh, including what uh, fertilizers you would recommend to apply. That's why I asked that previous question. Yeah. Well, what again, are the total, totals for NPK and maybe trace elements that, we, that the winter wheat uh, is looking in the soil, both in the organic matter and in uh, mineral uh, fertilizers. Uh, yeah. so, Generally, so you wouldn't, I mean, if, let's generalize here. You, you want to get root development. You don't want top lush, lush growth. So you would restrict nitrogen input um, just to get the crop going, okay? But you don't want it to grow away too quick, particularly mm -hmm. as it's changing now with less snow, but there again, you might get a very low temperature. So you want to minimize uh, winter kill as much as possible. Uh, I would say that depending on the indices again, uh, phosphate would be one because you want to encourage root development. But that again depends on the pH, on what's available, what type of phosphate is in the soil, is it available to the plant, and then maybe a little bit of potash. Okay. Uh, with regards to trace elements, then that's a difficult one because that, without actually knowing the indices within the soil, I wouldn't. I would be very dubious to recommend putting just a trace element on if it's not required. I don't know what you would mm -hmm. think, Peter. No, you, you need to base it on a soil analysis and previous cropping up offtake. So yeah. that's that's why I can't just say this is the recommendation because every single field is going to be different Correct. on the same farm, let alone yeah. from different countries. I mean, yeah. I, I would always follow my RB209, which I keep on the shelf above me, which is my guide 
I'm probably not on camera, but yeah, it's my guide to what I what I do and what I'm putting on. And then the trace elements will be based on the soil analysis. Yeah. And I'd be look yeah. I'd be looking for that soil analysis to have occurred within the last two and at most three years to understand what we're adding, what yeah. we're putting on. And if it was done two or three years ago, I'd be looking at the previous cropping that's gone on and what that's taken off to be looking on what I what I add add in. Yeah. But but as a generalization, Roman, small mm -hmm. amount of nitrogen, probably some phosphate and a bit of potash. And then yeah. depending on what the crop is, and as Peter says, what you've got from previous experience, maybe you know there might be some sulfur in there, perhaps. But yeah, that that I mean, would be. I'm, I'm almost now putting a sulfur on a standard on a lot of crops, so I'm tending to use a calcium sulfur product, which is is a bit slower release, um, and it's got sulfur. But where where we've done a good job in the the north in North Europe in reducing the environmental pollution. We're seeing more and more, especially on brassica type crops, sulfur deficiencies. So we're adding that in as a standard now. Yeah. And a lot of yeah. a lot of the calcium um, manufacturers will do a calcium sulfur mix, and they won't charge you any extra to put the sulfur in there. So yeah, mm -hmm. it makes sense. Okay, yeah. gentlemen, we have one more question here. Uh, I, I just to clarify what it's uh, what is meant by that question. But uh, uh, in any way, uh, if we change a little bit, uh, it will sound this is the following: uh, What are the most suitable conditions of growing and uh, crop rotation and uh, weather conditions uh, in order to insert the cover crops in between the main crops? So, uh, what are the f the number one cases when you should think about cover crops adding into the crop rotation? Well, from my point of view, I wouldn't want to see a field left bare for more than about four weeks. That would be my limit. So, even if you're just leaving a crop of weeds to grow on the top, that that's my key thing. And the classic that we'll see in Northern Europe is maize crops that are cut late. And then the field is left with nothing, just bare soil because of the herbicide program until the following spring. And that's a, that will lead to a disaster. So for me, about four weeks is the absolute max. But that cover, cover crop can be just letting the weeds grow. You know, it, it's just something to hold the soil together to stop it from moving, stop it from yeah. washing. Yeah, that, that I, I would concur with that. We, we're working with some of the NIAB uh, scientists. There's a group of them working within the European Union. And uh, we've been experimenting here with volunteers. So we've actually straw harrowed, encouraged the volunteers rather than have a cover crop and allowed the volunteers to grow. Okay, we try and keep on top of them, but at least there's something growing in there, which is again, is keeping the soil biota alive. Yeah, and, and I've even done things like put a, put a mower across the field before just to knock off weeds that are getting out of control. Just, just to get it so that there's a green cover there, but it's not actually going to seed. Mm, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, and coming back to the cover crop, Roman, yes. the cover crop selection would be dependent on the crop rotation and yeah. the soil types. And there's lots and lots of advice out there. There's specialist companies all over Europe. Uh, I, we've teamed up with a French company. Um, they've got a mm -hmm. base down in Hungary where they produce uh, various types of um seed combinations plant combinations to suit environment the what i mean by the environment i mean by your your uh, weather patterns so whether you're hot and yeah. dry or wet and cold um to to make the best out of it and in some areas france for example there is legislation down there particularly further south into france where you cannot leave the soil bare for any length of time so you have to get a cover crop in as soon as harvest is over um, or, or, or whatever and it might be you know in Peter's case a veg crop that's being lifted and you'll you, you have to establish something there because of the erosion problems brought about but also about using the nutrients that are in the soil and recycling the nutrients uh, Simon, you mentioned uh, there are different uh, types of cover crops to be included in different conditions. But if we take the most average uh, situation in uh, uh, the for, uh, in crop rotation, corn, soybeans, and wheat, conditions similar to the uh, the ones that you have in your area of United Kingdom, what would be uh, the 
cover crops, the actual crops included in the mixes uh, okay. of these cover crop seeds? Right, uh, again, it depends, but a common one would be buckwheat and phacelia and a red clover. Um, That's before corn? Clover. Yeah, that, that would be one that would um, be a common. Uh, a black oat would be another in addition with phacelia and vetch. Okay, that could be another common one. So what you're looking for is you want a certain amount of nitrogen fixing, depending on the timing. You mm -hmm. want something that's going to give you root mass, that's going to mm -hmm. keep the biota alive. And you may then want one with a powerful root that is going to help you with your soil structure and drainage. Mm -hmm. so I think so, so the thing I'd add into that is that within the herbicide programs on veg, we're now having to look at specific um, herbicides con to control phacelia because it's gone into the, ah. um, the cover yeah. cropping. And of course, it wasn't, a, it wasn't something we had to deal with before. We've introduced it for cover cropping reasons. We're now having to find ways to kill it within veg when it's self-seeded. So equally, managing um, a cover crop not going to seed is also very important. Vazelia yeah. looks beautiful as a cover crop in flower. It's great for pollinating insects. If it goes to seed, it's an absolute nightmare to control. Right, that's good, good advice, Peter. Yeah. Uh, I, I let me uh, talk to the audience. Uh, uh, пане Павло Яр, я бачу ваше запитання. Ми спробували задати його uh, нашим слухачам стосовно того, uh, доповідачам, перепрошую, стосовно використання покривних культур. Uh, в принципі, спробували покрити його достатньо обширно. Якщо є ще якісь додаткові запитання чи уточнення, будь ласка, пишіть. Uh, ми поки що продовжимо. So, uh, <coughs> we tried to answer that question about the cover crops as uh, specifically you you actually tried uh, as, as specifically as we could in, under the conditions uh, like you said uh, far away from the location where they will be planted sitting in the in the UK uh, so and um, is there anything else in terms of uh, strip tillage technology for the uh, small grains application that you haven't meant uh, Peter and Simon maybe uh, we just uh, concentrated the, the discussion on the other sides of application, but uh, uh, are there anything that should be kept on mind for the farmers who are doing strip tillage um, for the small grains? Because we will be finishing the webinar after that, so I just wanted to conclude uh, the main the main practical topic today: strip tillage. I think. I think from, from our side, what we're looking to do is to, um, you know, we want, we want to see something like this. Um, what we found with the cropping, with the banding, is we're now using mechanical weed control, which allows us to use a mechanical weed control with, a, with the Terra Blade, which is a hoe that we've developed, which works specific. Um, we've got various experiments going on with various different cropping, um, including maize and we're running with the with the terra blade now and that's working very effectively so from our point of view we're still learning about certain crops um, very definitely from the amount of machines that we've got or the amount of machines that's driving the principle of, of strip tilling with the Claydon system whether it be in in, in the southern Europe or Eastern Europe, the North, or other uh, uh, other areas, um, we're now pushing the boundaries on various crops, and we we haven't really found one that's created an issue. For example, in Italy, we're having really good success with soya. Uh, mm -hmm. In Germany, we're growing maize. Admittedly, it is uh, maize for aerob anaerobic digestion or forage maize. It's not grain maize because we feel that probably precision is the better way to go for the placement of the seed. But certainly we're getting some very good results for anaerobic digesters. Um, soya, uh, all the, most of the pulses and pretty much all the cereals, including uh, all seed rape, obviously. And so, where, so yeah, I was gonna say from my side, what, what we found, so we've, we've moved on to some crops will suit um, strip tillage processes is quite well and especially where you actually in effect rotivate because something, something like say a brassica needs um, a bit more cultivation to be able to plant a module into um, 
I found a couple of crops that aren't very vigorous rooted that have struggled a bit more. We've gone back to more traditional um, cultivation techniques. And that's purely because they're always a struggle to establish anyway. And we found with French beans, for example, we didn't get the yields when we want to a, a min till system. And that was a min till rather than a strip till system. But there, there was some similarities to the, um, the way the grain systems work. And actually, we needed to go back to a much deeper rooting zone to get to allow it to get down. And we feel it was just purely that the crop is, is always a struggle to establish. and It just didn't have the ability to root down. Fair enough. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think it's fair enough. I mean, we've got many benefits with it. Um, I think one of the questions we had earlier was uh, customers' perception. And because it is so different, and it's so different to what people have done traditionally, that there is a big resistance there. But what we're finding now is where we get a system in an area, we are now then starting where farmers yeah. have been looking, as we say in England, over the hedge. So they look and see what their neighbours are doing. Um, the same now, in, in Ukraine as well. Yeah, we're now starting yeah. to get big numbers uh, that are growing. And it's, you know, we have to be careful here. Financial cost is one thing because you can mm -hmm. reduce your cost of establishment to the detriment of yield. And yield has got to be king. And, you know, we're comfortable now providing that people follow our advice. And this is one of the biggest issues we have is that people will adopt partially the system and won't follow the full advice. And that's what I would say with any, you know, any strict till system. And you can see the cost comparisons here are massive. Now, if we start looking at that alone, that's going to be a key driver. But what we must remember, and generally, our yield year on year should be roughly the same to the conventional system. And then we would expect a slight yield increase. Now, I'm not saying that's going to be massive. It depends. There's so many variables. But the big key point is the cost reduction and the yeah. time saved. You know, time saving may be not so important or it would be important for the big agrarian companies in Ukraine because they have many hectares to deal with. But in Northern Europe, we have weather windows and where the weather starts shutting down. So we have to try and do things as efficiently as possible for the weather, not just the cost saving. And the other thing, as well as the cost side of it, if you look at the carbon usage on farm, that reduction in yeah. diesel is a massive reduction in the carbon um, usage yeah. on the farm in effect. And that now ties into a lot. And with the government schemes being about environmental schemes, that's got a big benefit within the, within the business. Yeah. And I, and I think fun, um, the environmental side the influences that are coming to bear on government is very certainly going to drive future legislation. I mean, we're finding now, uh, for example, in Lithuania, they've now finished with the fuel subsidy for farmers to try and discourage them from using too much diesel. So we're starting to see in, in small ways um, that legislation is starting to, to appear. You know, erosion, uh, there's a big concern about soil erosion. A very big concern and you know if we can mimic that on the arable side of things where we're growing combinable crops that would then help us on peter's side to then allow them to grow vegetable crops productively without inhibiting um the the the, the impact potentially of, of 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 high levels of cultivation so if we can try and minimize it in some ways you know working together as an industry to to try and reduce the environmental impact Carbon is one thing. I mean, every time we move the soil, we release CO2 into the atmosphere. CO2 is carbon, mm -hmm. or CO2 is carbon. Carbon is organic matter. And there's been much work done. Uh, one notable, notable um, science, soil scientist in the States, he's unfortunately retired now, did a lot of work 20 years ago where they actually measured the amount of carbon release. And it and is it, horrifying. It, it is absolutely horrifying to conventional cultivation systems, plough based in particular, the amount of carbon that's released into the atmosphere. And in addition to carbon, also is the uh, water, the yes, uh, yes. humidity and age path uh, as far as the um, evaporation. Uh, age path uh, lets out about 10 
in average millimeters of uh, water from the soil into the air. We have one more question uh, here. Uh, so if you compare the classical row crop planting and the strip till row crop planting, uh, so the fertilization program, should it be changed uh, if you shift to the strip tillage or it should be remained the same and the farmer should expect better yields? Simon, that's a question probably to you. I think, yeah, the row crop. Now, when you're talking traditional row crop, you're talking about things like sugar beet or maize, that type of thing. Ma yeah? Maize, I, maize, I think maybe. we should focus yeah, maize. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right, okay. On grain maize, because we are not a precision planter, where we plant the crop, so maybe 20 centimetres spacing, for example, mm -hmm. if you would mm -hmm. do with maize, um, then I would say for grain maize, I would stay with the traditional system. Now, for example, we have a very large grower or several large growers in Bulgaria who actually plant cover crop with our, with the Claydon drill, strip till, and then they seed with their traditional um, precision planter direct in the spring because the cover crop just kept the soil alive and they are getting very, very good results with that. Now, if you take um, other crops, we have done some work in the Ukraine uh, over the last three years with sunflower, and we've got some very good results using strip tillage for sunflower, using the Claydon drill. Uh, and I think that's down to moisture preservation and only disturbing the soil when we're seeding. So I think in answer to that question, if I was growing grain maize, then I would consider cover crops from the work that we've done down in Bulgaria, and we've got many thousands of hectares there, um, and then use your traditional um, precision planter. If I was using grain, if I was growing maize for an anaerobic digester or for animal feed, then I would consider using the Claydon system per se, because we've got very good results. Uh, the uh, cellulose numbers are good. The um, starch numbers are good as well and you're not putting all those high costs in and i have to say with maize production generally the soil does take a very big uh, hammering from the cultivations which is again coming back to what peter said earlier where they happen to grow um, companion crops to stop the erosion from the maize once it's harvested so i hope that answers the question Yes, uh, to, to me, it is more than enough to answer that question. Other than that, we are coming to an end uh, of our webinar. The time is uh, running out. Uh, so, gentlemen, thank you very much for your time, for your expertise. Thank you, thank you for the invite. Thank I, you for the invitation. I hope that in the future we will have a chance to uh, have you physically here and the audience would uh, uh, also have a chance to physically talk to you and ask the questions they're interested in. This is just one, one of the ways to do it. Uh, so all the best to you. Uh, thank you for the, thank you to the audience as well for listening to us uh, and enjoy high yields, good yields and high prices for the commodities. Okay, that's thank it. You. Thank you very much for your attention. And if anybody's got any questions outside, I would say, uh, Irina has our email addresses, both Peter and I, we, I'd be quite happy to take questions and I would try and answer them. Um, I would also answer them because I have a colleague, Roman, who mm -hmm. works in Ukraine, so we could get those answered in Russian or Ukrainian, no problem. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank, thank you. you. All thank the you. best to everyone.